Skid Row would rise to prominence in the late 80s on the strength of their self-titled debut album, which produced three big hits, including 18 and Life, I Remember You, and Youth Gone Wild. But the band's time together with frontman Sebastian Bach would be both a blessing and a curse. It would result in the frontman being fired by the band. Today, let's take a look at why Sebastian Bach was fired from Skid Row. The story of Skid Row began with founding members bassist Rachel Bolin and guitarist Dave Snake Sabo, who both hailed from New Jersey. Sabo lived a few blocks away from John Bon Jovi, who he was friends with. It would be that relationship that would be instrumental in Skid Row's success, with Sabo telling Louder Sound that the pair had made a pact when they were just seven years old, that if both of them became rock stars, the first person to get there would promise to help the other out. He would recall to Louder Sound, it was obvious that John was going to get there first, but he said that when our band was right, he would go out on a limb for us, and he was true to his word. John came to see us live, critiqued us, and provided the benefit of his experience, which was invaluable. Bolin and Sabo would end up putting together a band with drummer Rob Afuso and guitarist Scotty Hill. The first frontman would be former Anthrax singer Matt Fallon. It would be Sabo's old friend John Bon Jovi, who in 1986 was now a big star, and got Skid Row to open three shows for them in Pennsylvania. At this time, Fallon was still fronting the group and Skid Row were unsigned, but following the gigs, it became apparent that something needed to change within the band. Sabo would recall to Louder Sound what happened after the show, saying, It was exciting playing in front of 7,000 people, sold out with one of the best buds as the headliner. Then Doc McGee, who was Bon Jovi's manager at the time, comes in the dressing room and goes, The band's great, the songs are great, but you need a singer. Fallon would soon be fired and the band would undergo a nine-month search for a new singer. Future Molly Crew frontman John Karabi at one point offered to audition for the band, but things wouldn't work out. It was during their search for a new frontman that the band would pen hits including Youth Gone Wild, 18 in Life, and I Remember You that would appear on their debut album. The foursome soon grew frustrated with the search for a singer and even formed a short-lived cover band named The Blows which played Sex Pistols and Ramones cover tunes, but their prayers would finally be answered in Sebastian Bach. Born in the Bahamas to an accomplished painter and gallery owner father, Sebastian Bach's birth name was Sebastian Bjerk, and he would reside in both California and Eastern Canada in his younger years. He would admit to Rolling Stone that he was, not I quote, a straight-A bully at a private school he attended that was also attended by Prince Andrew, who he described in the same interview as being, and I quote, an effing a-hole. By the eighth grade, his father would admit that Sebastian started taking a liking to music, especially rock and roll, but Bach would butt heads over the way to go about having a career in music with his dad, thinking his son should attend Juilliard, but the future Skid Row frontman had other thoughts. By the age of 15, he dropped out of school and moved to Toronto, Canada, and changed his name to Bach. Standing six foot three, he looked a lot older than his age, allowing him to get into music clubs and play with bands, including the act Kid Wicked. It was a band who, in some instances, had members twice Bach's age. It was during this time Bach would find himself performing at a wedding of rock photographer Mark Weiss and singing on stage with the members of Twisted Sister and Kevin Debro of Quiet Riot fame, as well as guitarist Zach Wilde. The wedding happened to be attended by John Bon Jovi's parents, and they were so impressed they asked Bach to try out for Skid Row. Skid Row would end up sending a tape featuring a four-song cassette to Bach, with demos for songs including 18 in Life and Youth Gone Wild. Bach would recall to Louder Sound, I kept listening to the tape because I couldn't get those two songs out of my head. I said if I could reinvent the melody lines, especially in 18 in Life, and put some Halford-esque kind of notes, I could make this into something that I'd be really proud of. Bach soon got the job of fronting the band, but almost immediately, they saw that the singer was pretty volatile. At their first meeting together, they would get into a fistfight at a local bar, and despite hailing it as a bonding moment, it would foreshadow what was to come. To support the group's first album, the band went out on the road with Bon Jovi. It was during the last night of the tour both bands played pranks on one another, as Bon Jovi's stage crew would douse Bach with ice milk prior to Skid Row hitting the stage. Angered Bach took to the stage to express his displeasure, calling out John Bon Jovi. Adding to the tension was that prior to getting signed, John and Richie Sambora took a lion's share of Skid Row's publishing. Then while on tour the same year with Aerosmith in what was commonly referred to as the bottle incident, Bach would be hit by a bottle thrown from the audience during a concert in Springfield, Massachusetts. Bach would take the bottle and throw it back into the audience, striking a young female fan who wasn't responsible for throwing the bottle. Bach would then jump into the crowd to fight the person he thought threw the bottle, and it would invite bad press and litigation against the band. Only making matters worse was that Bach was photographed wearing a t-shirt that bared an anti-gay slogan, something Bach claimed a fan gave him, and he would go on to claim he never read what the shirt said. 
he would give an uncomfortable interview to Kurt Loder on MTV where he expressed his regrets over his actions. Rachel Boland would tell Louder Sound, splitting the little girl's head open, well it was awful and it put a huge wedge in the center of the band. That and the t-shirt he wore, some kid had given it to him up in Winnipeg and he put it on when we were in Los Angeles. I distinctly remember telling him I wouldn't wear that if I were you, but he did it anyways. By that point, stupid shit he was doing almost became sociopathic. He seemed to feel he was above all rules and regulations. The band would return in 1991 with their second album, Slave to the Grind, which debuted at the top of the Billboard charts, making it the heaviest album in history to do so. Despite the newfound success, Bach's outbursts were no different. During the tour to support the album, he would pull down his pants on stage while on tour with Megadeth and Pantera, and wipe his bare bum with a copy of a local newspaper. In the summer of 1991, the band was on the road with Guns N' Roses, playing a show at Wembley Stadium when Bach would read a letter from the city council warning the band not to play the song called Get the F Out. These actions further infuriated his bandmates, and also contributing to the tension was his drug use. The band wouldn't return with an album of new material until four years later in 1995 when they put out Subhuman Race. The long layover happened on the advice of the group's manager, who worried about the impact of alternative rock and grunge and what that would do to Skid Row's career. It didn't really matter though. Subhuman Race was a commercial disappointment and the group's relationship with Bach only deteriorated. The frontman also wanted to take a bigger role in songwriting, something Bolin and Sabo pushed back against. Skid Row was the opening act for Van Halen on their North America leg of their Balance Tour in the mid-90s, and they would play a handful of shows in South America as well. Eventually, Bach would leave the band in late 1996 after an argument with Bolin over a disagreement of whether the band should open for Kiss on the reunion tour or not. Bach wanted to open while his bandmates felt they were too big to open for Kiss. Adding to the tension was creative direction over where the band's music should go. Bach would tell Legendary Rock interviews in 2012, I was 100% fired from the band. They sent me some new music and I told them straight up that I didn't like it and wanted us to write some more because I wasn't going to sing these songs. They got all mad and Doc called me and said, well, you have to sing it because you're the singer in the band. I don't know about you, Mr. Rock Band guitarist and bassist, but I don't get into this rock and roll band to play songs that suck. Things would come to a head when Bach left an angry voicemail on Sabo's answering machine in late 1996. Guitarist Scotty Hill would tell another effing podcast, that caused a giant uproar is what it did, and Sebastian did something to Snake that was so unacceptable. He called his house on Thanksgiving and said some horrible things into his answering machine, and Snake says, you know what, we're not going to be in a band with you anymore, there you go, it's as simple as that. Skid Row would end up soldiering on with several new singers after Bach's departure, but they haven't been able to recapture their past success. The band has gotten several high-profile offers to reunite with Bach, but nothing has come of it. Bach seems more open to a reunion than his former bandmates do. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. We'll see you again. Rock and roll your stories. Take care.